Every company that deals with payments deals with fraud. The question is not whether fraud will occur on your system, but rather how much of it you can detect and prevent. If a payments company flags too many transactions as fraudulent, then real transactions might accidentally get flagged as fraudulent as well. But if you don't reject enough of the fraudulent transactions, then you might not be able to make any money at all. Because fraud detection is such a difficult optimization problem, it's a good fit for machine learning techniques. Today's guest, Michael Manapot, works on machine learning fraud detection at Stripe. This conversation explores aspects of both data science and data engineering. Michael seems to benefit from having both a depth of knowledge in data science and data engineering, and this made me question whether these two subjects are roles that an engineering team wants to separate. Maybe all the data scientists should know data engineering as well. This is the third in a series of episodes about Stripe engineering. Throughout these episodes, we've tried to give a picture for how Stripe's engineering culture works, and we hope to do this more in different episodes in the future, different experimental series where we tie together a topic across several episodes. We would love to get your feedback for what you think of this format and this little mini-series. You can send us an email, you can join the Slack group, or you can fill out our listener survey, or you can do all of these things. They're available on softwareengineeringdaily.com, and we really appreciate your feedback, so if you can give us any, it would be tremendously useful. DICE helps you easily manage your tech career by offering a wide range of job opportunities and tools to help you advance your career. Visit DICE and support Software Engineering Daily at dice.com slash sedaily and check out the new DICE Careers mobile app. This user-friendly app gives you access to new opportunities in new ways. Not only can you browse thousands of tech jobs, but you can now discover what your skills are worth with the DICE Careers Market Value Calculator. If you're wondering what's next, DICE's brand new career pathing tool helps you understand which roles you can transition to based on your job title, location, and skill set. DICE even identifies gaps in your experience and suggests the skills that you'll need to make a switch. Don't just look for a job. Manage your tech career with DICE. Visit the App Store and download the Dice Careers app on Android or iOS. To learn more and support Software Engineering Daily, go to dice.com slash sedaily. Thanks to Dice for being a new sponsor of Software Engineering Daily. We really appreciate it. Michael Manipat works on machine learning at Stripe. Michael, welcome to Software Engineering Daily. Thanks for having me. At a high level, what are the applications of machine learning at Stripe? We have a few right now. The first two are both in the area of fraud, and we call them merchant fraud and transaction fraud. So in the former merchant fraud, we're attempting to build ML models to defend Stripe from fraud itself. So what what does that mean? Lots of people set up for Stripe accounts every day to take payments online, uh, to run their businesses. But fraudsters can also sign up to use Stripe pretending to be businesses. So let's say I'm a fraudster. I'll go online, create a Stripe account, write an integration with the Stripe API, just like a normal user. Then I'll go buy a bunch of stolen credit cards and then use Stripe to charge them one by one. So let's say I've charged a bunch of cards. Stripe thinks, okay, Michael's company is this legitimate user. I'll now transfer him the funds. I'll withdraw them, close my bank account, and disappear. Eventually, all of those cardholders will discover these charges from Michael's company, which they didn't make. They'll charge them back. And typically, Stripe would ask the merchant for those funds back if there's a charge back. But because I've disappeared, Stripe's left holding the bill. So that has a direct impact on Stripe's bottom line. And we built an ML system here that every time a charge is made, we'll take the entire history of that merchant's charge history and we'll run an ML algorithm on it or an ML model that'll look at things like what fraction of the charges were declined, what fraction were made from outside the merchant's country, what was the ratio of this to that, and we'll come up with a score or a classifier score for that merchant, combine that with some measure of our financial exposure, and these two numbers together form what we call a ranking score. 
So you can think of every time a payment is being made at Stripe, and this happens, you know, dozens of times a second. We are computing a classifier score, putting that together with a ranking score, ranking all of our users by financial ex- or probability of loss, essentially, or rather expected loss. And we have our risk analysts take a look at the users with the most expected loss and make a decision on whether or not they're good or bad. So they get approved or uh, rejected by a human ultimately. Yeah. So that's merchant fraud. Transaction fraud is defending Stripe users from fraud. So that means, let's say you're taking uh, donations for this podcast online. I could go and and take my small credit cards and say make 10 cent donations just to see which ones are active. Eventually, again, the cardholders will discover these small transactions, charge them back, and then you would be on the hook for the chargebacks uh, because you're a legitimate user. So in this model, instead of scoring asynchronously and raising something for review, we're actually scoring as part of the core Stripe API flow yeah. and making a decision to accept the charge or to reject it in real time as each charge is made. Got it. So those two fraud pillars have been our biggest applications for as long as we've had ML here, which is almost four years now. We do ML in some other areas. We're doing some natural language processing on support tickets, for example. So someone writes in and says, hey, I took some, or I, there were some payments made from my company a few days ago. There have been no deposits. Uh, what's going on? Where's my money? Yeah. And you can imagine that the vast majority of support tickets that come into Stripe correspond in a very simple way to structured database queries. In this example, it's take the user ID, take the last transfer for that user, and look it up, read off the status, right? So we're hoping to be in a world sometime soon where not exactly chatbot-like, but sort of chatbot-like, sure. you know, we're going to respond automatically to queries that are very clearly asking something specific about a user's business or account. You touched on a lot of things. I want to define one term that is so core to fraud and so core to what you do at Stripe that you explained already, but I just want to define it again. What is a chargeback? So if you log into your American Express account online or your Chase account, and you're looking at charges, charges that you made at Whole Foods or Panera or whatever, and, uh, you'll often see this button next to it or a link that says something like dispute or inquire about this transaction. So if you're scanning your charges online when you're logged into your car, you know, to your card issuing bank's website, and there's something that you see there that doesn't look familiar, like what is this charge for $8,000 from this jewelry store in, in New York, you would click that button and that button would say, fill out some information like yes or no, did you make this charge? Well, probably not. Uh, you know, do you, did you ever shop with this merchant before? Yes or no? So you'll ask, you'll, you'll answer the small quiz and the card issuer will then transmit that information, uh, to, to Stripe if, if that merchant used Stripe. So that is essentially saying the cardholder claims that he or she did not make this charge and uh, claims or thinks it's fraudulent. So when that happens, Stripe has to present this go charge back to the user or to our merchants and say, you know, insert Stripe user here, that your customer or this customer is claiming that this payment was fraudulent. Do you have evidence that it was not actually fraudulent? And that evidence would be something like maybe an email exchange with the user. Uh, in the world of retail, it would be a receipt with a signature, which we obviously don't have. But suffice it to say that most of the time, Online businesses have a hard time presenting evidence for chargebacks because you aren't really collecting that much information. But there's this exchange between the banks and the merchant mediated by Stripe. Eventually, if the merchant does not provide satisfactory evidence, uh, Stripe is going to be asked to claw the funds back from the merchant and levy a fee. So even if you aren't responsible as a business for uh you know, you're not the one committing fraud. If a fraudster is buying something from you, it's often the case that you'll be left or you'll be, you'll end up holding the bill for that. 
The reason I wanted you to define that is because you touched on so many interesting aspects of machine learning. You touched on uh, merchant fraud, transaction fraud, the ticketing system potential of machine learning. I want to zoom in on this fraud detection problem because I know Stripe has spent a lot of time on this and we've interviewed a lot of other companies about fraud detection and why this is such a hard and general problem. What kind of model would be useful to build to detect the chargeback fraud? One thing that has been true since we started this program, it's still true today, is that we think of fraud detection and fraud detection for machine learning as primarily an engineering problem and not as much what you might call a core machine learning problem. And what I mean by that is the vast majority of our work has been in building the infrastructure and the engineering systems to get us the right data at the right time. And whether we put that data into a logistic regression, which is a simple model, or a random forest, which is a more complicated one, or a neural net, which is even more complicated, uh, that hasn't been the focus. The focus has been on what you call in the machine learning world feature generation. So what do I mean by that? Let's go back to the transaction fraud case of Stripe attempting to or trying to defend its users from fraud. So I'm a fraudster. I make a charge at your website. So what are some of the things that are potentially indicative of fraud? One is where was the card issued, right? Was it issued in the U.S. or was it issued in some other country? Uh, where am I making the charge from? Am I making it from an IP address in the U.S. or an IP address from somewhere else in the world? Do these countries match? Is the amount typical for your business or is it two or three standard deviations above the mean? So there are all of these basic things you see on a charge that together a machine learning model can use to make an assessment on fraud risk. But really the more powerful features for fraud are about context. So what happened immediately before that charge? So things like you're making it from IP address 1.2.3.4. How many distinct cards were seen from that IP address in the past day or the past week? Were all of those cards issued in the US? Or did you see cards from multiple countries from the same IP address uh, in the past day, right? Or, you know, I'm seeing a charge for this card. Is this charge being made from one of the two IP addresses from which I've seen this card most frequently in the past? So the real lift we've gotten for almost four years now is in expanding the range of these types of features we can compute. We began by just saying, let's do some simple windowed counters. How many times did X happen over the preceding hour or day? And then you get into more complicated aggregates, things like what you might call heavy hitters, you know, is this charge coming from one of the top N email addresses for this card, one of the or top three IPs for the card, things, things of that sort. So we've invested an incredible amount of time in developing the infrastructure to be able to compose these features and essentially issue a few command line, or command line commands to get the data both for model training and for production scoring. Uh, so that's like the, uh, that's been our emphasis. And we've done a bit of work on experimenting with ML algorithms. And by that, I mean, you know, very early on, we used logistic regression, then we moved to decision trees, then we moved to random forests. We spent a lot of time tuning the parameters of these forests, right? How big are our trees? How deep do they go? And so forth. Uh, and those were all, all of those transitions were helpful. But really, we see the biggest gains still in feature engineering and in sort of picking out these features that are pretty hard to compute uh, from an infrastructure standpoint, even though they're very intuitive to, to data scientists. Are you ready to build a stunning new website? With Wix.com, you can easily create a professional online presence for you and your clients. It's easy. Choose from hundreds of beautiful, designer-made templates. Use the drag-and-drop editor to customize anything and everything. Add your text, images, videos, and more. Wix makes it easy to get your stunning website looking exactly the way that you want. 
Plus, your site is mobile optimized, so you'll look amazing on any device. Whatever you need a website for, Wix has you covered. The possibilities are endless, so showcase your talents. Start that dev blog detailing your latest projects. Grow your business and network with Wix apps that are designed to work seamlessly with your site. Or simply explore and share new ideas. You decide. Over 100 million people choose Wix to create their website. What are you waiting for? Make yours happen today. It's easy and free. Just go to Wix.com. That's W-I-X.com and create your stunning website today. There is this interesting trade-off between allowing in transactions that might be chargebacks and having a chargeback that you have to eat, uh, which ends up being a useful data point and being a little more cautious and pro, you know going for the false positive as opposed to the false negative. Can you dive in a little for how you have traded off there and how you've adjusted those trade-offs over time in order to maybe, you know, gather data, train the model, and then be like, okay, now let's try to be more a little more aggressive in what we're preventing. So I think there are, to unpack that a bit, there are probably two questions in there. Okay. One of the questions is a great one about choosing the right trade-off between false positives and false negatives, yeah. just as a business that is using ML to fight fraud and the second question, which is also incredibly interesting and deep, is if you have a machine learning model that's blocking fraud relatively well, it's essentially cannibalizing data for future iterations of that model. And you have to do something there so that you're not just stuck with this one model forever. Is that uh, sure. kind of capturing both of the yes. questions? Yes, yes. So let's do the first one first. Uh, let's address the first question, which is, how do you th- reason about this trade-off between yeah. false positives and false negatives? And something we've, we've seen a lot at Stripe is that fraud is such a jarring experience for your users. Many users don't even know that this is a possibility, right? That they don't know that there's this notion of chargeback or disputes, right? So the first time it happens, it can be, uh, they're pretty terrifying. But I, I mentioned that because there is what you might call a systematic bias towards blocking a lot of charges and not thinking about lost business and lost conversions, right? You can obviously very trivially have a fraud rate of zero by blocking all of your volume, and that would be pretty terrible. Uh, not that people want that, but just the, the general trend or people's predilection is towards being very aggressive. Uh, we want to encourage our users to reason about fraud in a rigorous way. And, and what does that mean? Well, it turns out that your trade-off between false positives and false negatives is essentially controlled by your margin as a business. So let's say you're a very low margin business. You're selling a product for a thousand dollars, uh, but it costs you 900 to produce, or say $909 to produce. So you're only making $10 for every sale. Now, if that gets charged back, say you ship the product and then there's a charge back, you're essentially out $990, which means you have to make 99 legitimate sales to make that back. So if those are your unit economics, you want to be incredibly aggressive and block a lot of legitimate transactions because a single false negative is highly costly. On the other hand, if you're selling, say, a digital good, which has zero marginal cost of production, uh, and you're selling for $10, and it literally costs you nothing to make, then if there's a chargeback, there's an issue with the chargeback fee, which you have to take into account, but you're not losing the cost of goods sold. So again, modulo this chargeback fee, you can afford to allow a lot of fraud through. Yeah. And you can do a pretty simple computation that says if your item cost N and your average margin is M, yeah. then you should be targeting a uh, false positive, false negative trade-off of, of, of so-and-so. Yeah. And we're not quite there yet. 
right now with our user-facing fire prevention tools, you can do things like, say, block charges if Stripe thinks the risk level is high or if it's medium or if it's low. But we want to be in a point in the future where you can tell us what your economics are and we will automatically throttle our system so that we are revenue maximizing for you. Got it. So that's the that's the spiel on on the trade off between yes. plus positives. Question and one. Yes, question one. The second question is one that, to be honest, we're still working on resolving today. And just to again set the context, let let's say let's rewind time. Let's say it's the the end of 2013, and at that time. We were building our very first ML model for fraud. We had data from Stripe's first years of existence. And, you know, we were still relatively small back then. We weren't doing any automated blocking of fraud. So we had a relatively rich data set of charges and chargebacks. We built the model, looked great in validation, put it into production, and just said, you know, if the score is sufficiently high, let's block the charge. Uh, if, not, if not, if not high enough, let's allow it to go through. So it's chugging along in production. We see the fraud rate go down precipitously. Uh, things look, things look pretty good. So let's say a few months later, we decide to retrain the model because fraud trends, fraud trends tr- uh, change. Uh, we have new features we want to use and so forth. Well, we did that and it turned out that even though our methodology was entirely the same, and we had new features and newer data, the performance seemed to sort of dip off a lot. And we were just like, what's going on here? Why does this not look as good as it did? Well, the answer was that we were blocking all of the obvious fraud with the first model. So we were then training our new model on what you might just call the residual, all the fraud we didn't catch. So we, we had a, what was a harder ML problem. We, had, we were sort of focusing just on the the cases that our original ML did, did not catch. So if we went ahead and we launched that model, the original one that was catching what you might call the first wave of easy fraud would have to remain in production forever because each additional model would only be trained on the residual of all of the previous models. Uh, and let me know if, uh, if, this making, you know, if this makes sense. I follow. So what do we do or how do we address that? The, the idea here is that you actually want to probabilistically sample from the transactions that you actually would have blocked. So let's say you have this classifier, it's scoring charges, and we have a policy that says block the charge if the score is above 50. So 50 is a decision boundary. And really, you know, if a charge has a score of 51, that doesn't make it that much more likely to be fraudulent than a charge that has a score of 49. So there's nothing magical or true about this arbitrarily chosen, not arbitrarily chosen, it's chosen for sort of reasons to optimize precision recall. But, you know, the, the particular number that we use as a threshold for model triggering is just a number. And on either side of that, there are both false positives and false negatives. So you can imagine something to start where we say, of all the charges that have a score above 50 that we would ordinarily block, let's let through 2% of them, just so we can see what happens and allow the charge to either be successful or charged back. So we're letting through a small fraction of charges and we can observe the outcome. And let's say there's a charge of a, with score 55. We let it through and it was charged back. Remember, we are letting these things through with a rate of 0.02. So that one charge actually can be imagined to correspond to 50 other similar charges uh, that we actually blocked. So we would say in our training data, we have the sample from the pass through set and we'll give it a weight of 50 so that we have a training set, which in some ways is an approximation of the world if we hadn't been doing any blocking. So iteration one here is just saying, flip a coin or pick a random number from the unit interval. And if it's 0.02 or lower, let the charge through, even if the score was above 50. Now, there are some problems with that. 
the most obvious one being a charge with a score of 51 is much less likely to be fraudulent than a charge with a score of 100 or 99. So we don't want to just expose our users to sort of a low level amount of potentially additional fraud for data collection. So how can we be smarter about it? And the idea here is that we will let charges through for probabilistic sampling uh, at a rate inversely proportional to the score. So that means something like if the score is 51, the pass-through rate will be 2%. If it's 60, the pass-through rate will be 1%. If the score is 99, the pass-through rate will be 0.01%. Interesting. So that way we are passing through the charges, you know, of a score of 51 that are the most likely to actually not be fraud among the ones we would block. Whereas the ones that uh, we are almost certain are fraud almost never get passed through. Fascinating. So we so we have that data, yeah. and then for training, we're sort of appropriately weighting each of yeah, these yeah. samples. So again, just to sort of belabor the point, if we've passed through a charge with a score of 99, and it ends up not being charged back, so it would have been a false positive. Sure. In our training data set, we will weight it by a factor of 1,000, because... There was a one in a thousand probability that we passed it through. We did. It was not fraudulent. So that corresponds to a thousand false positives uh, in the world. It's just that 999 of them were actually blocked. Got it. Now, we've been talking pretty abstractly about these transactions that are going through the system. I want to understand better the data engineering side of things. I don't know how familiar you are with that infrastructure, but I'd love to know what are the different pieces of data from the main... Because I just talked to Ethan or Evan... Evan? Evan. (laughs) I just talked to Evan, and we were discussing how you have the main transaction system, which is kind of this monolithic thing that processes transactions synchronously and then you've got the fraud detection system that is sort of off to the side because it's a giant stack in and of itself what are the pieces of data that are being shuttled from the main system into the fraud detection system how does that work what are the data layers in between there what are the databases you're using and so on so let me let's let's trace through the whole request flow and there are two parts here there is the production request flow which you might call sort of the prod side. And then there's the data side, which is all of the offline processes for training data generation and model building. So I can talk a little bit about both. Yeah. As I'm sure Evan mentioned to you, you know, we have for the core Stripe API, it's a, mostly a monolith written in Ruby. We're sort of storing data in Mongo and so forth. So the main Stripe API will make during the charging process a service call just over HTTP to a fraud scoring service. And that fraud scoring service will both read from Mongo to low charges and compute some basic features like card country, country of the IP and so forth. And it'll make HTTP calls to various other data services uh, to collect these aggregate features like number of times and happened over the past day. And I'll say more about what those are exactly in a second. But during the course of a Stripe charge, we're operating or primarily in Ruby, uh, making calls to Ruby services, uh, and then the scoring service will sort of talk to various other services for collecting data for features. And then we have a, a service in Scala called Diorama that does all of our model scoring. Uh, and I'll, this should become clear after I go into the sure. data pipeline. So yeah. every day, the entirety of our Mongo production databases are snapshotted and they're stored in Parquet, which is a columnar file format on S3. So every, every night at midnight, this process starts a few hours later. We have a snapshot of the universe sitting in Parquet. Mm-hmm. And various teams that Stripe for various purposes can do things like write MapReduce jobs on this data. It's loaded into Redshift for analysis and things like that. So how does this work for machine learning? Well, 
all of our future generation happens on Hadoop against these parquet sources and S3. So if you have an idea for a feature, you'll write a bit of Scala code and you'll run it on MapReduce and it'll eventually take in the parquet, compute the feature, uh, also output it to parquet somewhere else in S3. And then that S3 data ends up in Redshift. So you can go into Redshift and look at all of our features, see sort of the whole array of, of columns you've computed as potential signals for fraud. Then completely separate from that, we have a training pipeline in Python. So we'll pull down all of these features from Redshift and we'll build random forests and regressions and so forth using scikit-learn in Python. Now, that stuff happens pretty quickly. It takes a few hours to train a model. And we've written a custom serialization format for all of our models. So when the Python is done training, the script will write the model to a file and then again put that in S3. And this Scala model scoring service will load the model from S3 and then make its predictions available again via HTTP. So you would tell the model scoring service, you know, hit an endpoint that says score. Here's a model name corresponding to the S3 file name. Here's a JSON hash mapping feature names to values. And then the service would return a score. So to close the loop here, uh, actually, I, I'm, I'm missing one, one part. Uh, as part of the feature generation process, I'd mentioned earlier about uh, all of these data services that we use to create features from reduction. Uh, when we write jobs to produce data for training, uh, those jobs will also make real-time versions of that data available via other HTTP services. So we have a system that we actually were just Launch or finalizing in the past few weeks where you write a job just once and this job is trying to compute an aggregate feature over some window. So again, back to the canonical example of number of cards in this IP address in, in the past hour. So you write that job once in Scala and we have a framework that will run the job on Hadoop for batch data collect generation for training. And it'll also automatically execute the job on Storm for real-time processing. So this one job gets you both training data and as charges are coming in, it's processing events that are emitted by our main Ruby app doing this aggregation in real time. And these are, this is one of the services that I mentioned will get called as we're scoring. So to back up again to the original request flow, you make an API call to Stripe to charge a card. Uh, the Stripe API will make an internal RPC call to our scoring service. That scoring service will say, let's generate some basic features from Mongo. Let's query this HTTP front end for this storm aggregate computation. Uh, let's collect all of these features from these various sources into a hash. And then let's pass it to this Scala model evaluation service to get the score. And then that score gets propagated back compared to a configuration file to say, is the score above or below our threshold for blocking? And then the action is taken appropriately. Okay. Since I now know you have familiarity with the data engineering pipeline, I am wondering if you... So I've done these shows recently, and I, I asked Evan about this, um, where... If you have a stack that is partially Java and partially other stuff, like the you know a lot of your your machine learning models are built using Python, you can have these interop issues between Java and Python, for example. Um, maybe you don't have those issues, maybe you do, but I'm trying to get an understanding of what the canonical infrastructure, um, I guess bottlenecks that exist in the typical data engineering pipeline are. So maybe if you could give me, um, you know, what are the things that keep coming up that are the seem like bottlenecks uh, in your data engineering pipeline and um, how you're thinking about solving them? To go to the very beginning of your, of your question, 
all of our Python work happens offline. Uh, we never touch any Python code as part of our production flows. So there are no production interop issues between Ruby or JVM applications and, and Python. So Python is, is very much this isolated to this on-demand model training offline so, process. So, so sorry to interrupt, but I, I, I assume you can imagine a world in which there would be some interrupt. Of course, yeah. yeah. And in fact, you know, again, going if back... If you go to Spark or something. And, and use Spark Python or something. Yeah. So most of our... Uh, our data infrastructure issues now, uh, I'm definitely sort of biased from the, from the machine learning side. I would say it's the, the hardest problem has been the fact that we have two essentially entirely distinct worlds in that we, production is in Ruby and is, uh, our data is in MongoDB, but we have to do all of our batch computation in, on the JVM. Uh, and we're not reading from Mongo on the JVM, so we have to sort of do this snapshotting, which for one reason or another, if you have something like the, the parquet schema goes out of sync with the Mongo schema, then the job will just die and then data is behind for a day. Uh, or in the ML case, previously, every feature got defined twice. And one example of that is before the system I just described, the Lambda architecture system that executed computations both in real time on Storm and in batch on Hadoop. For something like a windowed counter, how many times did this card get used in the past day? We would compute those numbers historically by writing Scala on Hadoop, and we would compute them in production by writing Ruby code and using an entirely different storage mechanism. In this case, we were inserting charge IDs into Redis and doing counts over sorted sets. So the fact that our production world is in a stack that really isn't amenable to big data. In fact, I gave this talk a few years ago. Uh, the title was something like machine learning with a data unfriendly stack. Uh, and I remember giving the audience, or giving the talk and uh, at the end, the host came up and gave me a hug because he was so just stunned at sort of the machinations we had to go through at Stripe to sort of bridge this Ruby Mongo world with the Hadoop Java world. So uh, I would say it's it's a – I know this wasn't really what you were getting at, but our biggest issues on the infrastructure side have been around sort of developer experience and bridge, living with two – totally distinct stacks yeah. uh, and those two stacks being bridged by this sort of tenuous snapshotting process which was prone to failure uh, again because of little things like schemas going out of sync it's the or, lambda architecture yeah so i imagine that this is like simmering under the surface and you're just like gosh we're gonna have to figure this out eventually right you're like you can't have this forever right? is, is there some have you started to think of i mean this almost sounds like uh you know, when Amazon was like, finally realized, oh my gosh, we need to move to services. You know, like we need to break up the monolith into services. We need to do some sort of refactoring. Because as you bring more people on and more people are doing different things with the data infrastructure and somebody says, oh, I want to run this experiment over here. Or, oh, I want to integrate this thing with this thing. And you're just like, well, you, to do that in order, you know, we're going to have to have a three hours of infrastructure discussion. And then you're going to have to spend two weeks implementing the bridge between these Two things. I don't, I don't know. Are you starting to think about how to make these more copacetic? Yeah. So I, I think not to like. I hope I didn't insult. No. You. No, 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 no. 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 I mean, uh, we also want to make progress there. And working on the future here is an incredibly interesting and challenging problem, which we have from our uh, We have multiple teams working on it. So as an infrastructure problem, it's something that. The pain is clear, yeah. and the solution uh, will take a bit of an ingenuity. So it, it's, clear. It, it's fun to yeah, but it's fun it's fun to work on. So the Lambda architecture system was part one, in that now you are writing. Well, let me back up for a second. In the old world, every feature for our ML models was defined twice: once in Ruby on Mongo with various data stores to compute track of you know, uh, live cameras and so forth. And again, in Scala on Hadoop against uh, the parquet, parquet sources and, and the thrift schemas. So 
the Lambda architecture system was sort of the first iteration in making this more sane. So the idea here is that Ruby is now going to emit uh, the Ruby main Stripe app is going to emit just immutable events. Those events will have sort of certain core properties like IP address, car country, and so forth. Those events are getting serialized both as Parquet and S3 uh, and are going to Storm for this online aggregation. So when I, when I keep on referring to this, write a job once, get both the production values in real time and the batch values, both those computations are occurring over these event streams, mm -hmm. right? The event streams are going live to Storm and then the scoring service can query our HTTP wrapper around that for the value. And they're going to S3 where the batch portion of the Lambda architecture system can run the job in batch mode to get us historical training data. Mm -hmm. So uh, that at least was better than the old world where we were writing counters in Scalding and then rewriting them in Ruby in an entirely different paradigm. And you can imagine if you're a data scientist, you're coming out of school and you're great at building models and you can write some Scala code for batch data analysis, but you probably have not that much familiarity with, say, latency considerations right. in a Ruby app. So it was a pretty big stumbling block uh, or at least an impediment for fast model development. So now we're in this world where we're doing Lambda architecture, we're, we're emitting events, that begs the next question, which is, let's say I've discovered that one of the fields in my event is actually incorrectly defined, or I need to add a new field to this event because there's now some new property I'm capturing. I'll add it to the event generation in Ruby, but then what happens on the batch side? Obviously all your old events don't have those fields or they have the wrong fields. So you still have to go in and again, write a job, probably in Scalding, that will back compute the new fields or the corrected fields for all of your historical events. So it's in this event backfilling, uh, or the event back, the event backfilling is where there's still some amount of toil. Uh, and we're sort of thinking about how to get past that now. You touched on the question of building a model versus deploying that model to production. I've talked to a lot of machine learning people who have said that this is another canonical problem. Can you talk about how when somebody is building a model and they want to test it or do, is, do you have a kind of a workflow in place for how people test stuff and like what's the process of getting a model to production? There are essentially three phases. Phase one is just typically or the typical train the model in Python and look at the validation statistics and apply some nice in various ways and see, does this model look plausible? So let's say you've gotten past that uh, and you say from all the historical data, this model looks plausible. Now, like I mentioned a little bit earlier, this Python training script will also put that model serialized in some serialized form in S3, and you have it now available via this Scala-based scoring service. So part phase two is uh, we have what we call a shadow scoring service. So every time a payment comes in, we're scoring it and actioning it. And then that payment gets put onto a queue, and in the background asynchronously, we replay the payment against the shadow service, which is scoring all of our candidate models. And the idea is that it's async because we wanted to move the evaluation uh, out of the synchronous sort of latency sensitive path. So after this first phase of historical validation, we will run a model in this shadow environment for a week or two and say, okay, we're getting scores for every new charge. Let's look at things like the score distribution. Is it what we expect from validation? Let's look at the correlation of the new model scores with old model scores. Is it what we expect? Uh, if we have it in shadow, as we call it, long enough, we can actually even see some chargebacks come in and say, okay, this of all the charges that this model gave a score of 50 or above uh, over the past week and a half, uh, let's say 3% were actually charged back. And then we can say, well, 
given the approximate arrival time of chargebacks, that 3% actually corresponds to a 90-day chargeback rate of 50%, which again is in line with our expectations. So we have these models running in phase two in this shadow environment where we're sort of doing a bunch of sanity checking to make sure that distributions and outcomes are what we expect. And then after that, uh, we'll make a configuration change to say, move the scoring of this model from the shadow environment to the production environment. How do you minimize data cleaning at Stripe? I kind of think if, I even think it's fair to say that we've done that. <laughs> How do you approach data cleaning at Stripe? <laughs> it's maybe a more reasonable question. Well, I, I, what, you know, one, one thing that's nice is the, the atomic units of data for us, at least for fraud detection, are payments. And payments are essentially structured API calls with structured fields. Yeah. So there's some amount of taking a payment and flattening it out into the right fields and enriching or hydrating it, if you will. Uh, but it's not like, let's say, collecting data to build a chatbot or a natural language thing where there's a lot of cleaning to do, figuring out where the conversation begins or ends and so forth. Most of the data is sitting there and we just have to sort of rearrange fields in such a way that data is in a, in a form amenable for, for model training. But because we're dealing with essentially what our API calls, uh, you know, we're, we're not, there's not too much pre-processing that has to happen. Good customer relationships define the success of your business. Zendesk helps you build better mobile apps and retain users. With Zendesk Mobile SDKs, you can bring native in-app support to your app quickly and easily. If a user discovers a bug in your app, that user can view help content and start a conversation with your support team without leaving your app. The conversations go into Zendesk and can automatically include information about the user's app information, device information, usage history, and more. Best of all, this is included with Zendesk for no extra charge. Use the out-of-the-box iOS UI to get up and running quickly, or build your own UI and work with the SDK API providers. Keep your customers happy with Zendesk. Software Engineering Daily listeners can use promo code SEDAILY for $177 off. Thanks to Zendesk for supporting Software Engineering Daily. And you can check out Zendesk.com slash SEDAILY to support Software Engineering Daily and get $177 off your Zendesk. So... Recently, Stripe has been externalizing some of the machine learning for fraud detection into this service called Radar, which people can access as a service to do fraud detection for their own systems. Can you explain a bit how Radar works and the process of externalizing an internal system to basically turn it into a production system? We talked about the main kernel of Radar already, which is this synchronous transaction scoring system that is generating features and deciding in real time as part of the Stripe API flow to block or allow a charge. Uh, that's the oldest and arguably most important part of Radar. But in the early years of our ML program, this ML system was operating in the background, just blocking or allowing charges. Uh, and our users didn't have very much visibility into what was going on. So what we wanted to do with the radar program was two things. One, make people aware of what machine learning was doing and why it was doing it. And two, allow them to make adjustments at the margin to optimize outcomes. So what, what, what do I, I mean by these, by these two things? First, our scoring service was returning a score before, and if the score was high enough, we were blocking. But if you're a user starting your business, you're taking payments, it's not a good experience to just see, a, see something that says, Stripe has blocked this charge, we think it's fraud, end of story, 
right? You need to trust us that we are blocking the right things. You want to have some sense of visibility or agency over your outcomes. So we actually spend a lot of time building a model explanation system that will, when we return a score, also say something like, the score was high, and just believe us, but the score was high because we saw this card from a large number of countries in the past day, and the email address looks fake, and the IP address uh, was associated with a large number of cards in the past hour. Right? So if you see something like that, you can say, okay, Stripe has data that we don't have access to. We can't see it, but at least it's giving us some sense of why Stripe is doing what it's doing. So we thought it was really important to give that kind of in, uh, you know, that kind of visibility into the black box. Uh, so that was part one of radar, just surfacing the decisions and building this model introspection, introspection system. The other part of radar was this idea that users will have a lot of custom or proprietary information that we won't have. One example of that is just in the most trivial case, you know, there is some cross right baseline rate of fraud for cards from country X. And let's say that the fraud rate from country X across all of Stripe is quite high. So it's it wouldn't be surprising if Stripe's models thought that the comparison country equals X means the score is high. But now if you are a Stripe user in country X, maybe we've just expanded there, for example. Right and all your customers are from country X, that's going to be a situation in which our machine learning would potentially not do that well to start. Yeah. And if you can observe that, you want to be able to say something like, actually, don't block charges that come from country X. Uh, and Radar gives you a rules engine where you can say things like, like exactly that, right? Yeah. You know, if it's from country X, allow it. Or if it's from country Y, block it. Or if it's from IP address Z or email domain W, send it to manual review for your, uh, by your analyst. Yeah. So the idea here is that you know, we want things to be as automated as possible, but users will every now and then want to make adjustments and Radar's rule engine allows you to take the output of our ML and various other charge properties and compose these rules to optimize outcomes at the margin. What is so interesting to me about this is the fact that we're in a time now where you can build these software as a service platforms that are pretty technical and you can actually sell them to people and you can sell them to people at scale. What have been the conversations that you've had with the customers of Radar? Like, what are you learning about the level of technicality? that you can offer in a product? Because I think there's a lot of people listening to this podcast that are maybe starting their own software business or thinking about what software business to start. And I think um, this area of next generation, maybe it's like maybe it's not exactly developer tools, but like technical knowledge worker tools is is pretty wide open and it's, it's just an expanding surface area. So I don't know. Any, do you have any thoughts on that area? I think maybe one thought is what I think you probably don't want to do is to give people exactly what they ask for. Because these things are technical, they're very subtle, and what a, let's say, enterprise buyer might want might not be the right thing. And to give you a concrete example of that, you know, earlier on we were talking about this, not again, not uniform, but a very observable a bias towards being aggressive about fraud uh, and potentially blocking or wanting to stop too much, right? So if you come in with that bias, you will sort of look at a fraud product and focus on things like sort of how much fraud is it catching, uh, what will the fraud rate be after I implement it, uh, and not think about all the other things you're trading off against, like conversion rate and overall revenue. One of the things we built into Radar, which we think is key, and which no other party has done yet is a uh, instantaneous backtesting system. So what I mean by that is, let's say I decide after seeing one charge back from country X that I'm going to write a rule to block every charge from that country. Most rule systems for fraud in the past would just say, okay, rule is enabled. 
what we do is you compose that rule, you click next, and we will show you instantaneously what that rule would have done over the past six months, how many transactions did it match, how many of those were actually disputed as fraudulent, how many of them were refunded, how many of them were already blocked by Stripe, how many of them were successful and not fraudulent. And we'll show appropriate warnings like, FYI, this is a bad rule because you would be blocking 15 good charges for every bad charge that you catch with this thing. So the idea here is that our users do not ask us for this type of quantitative rule assessment. But our feeling was that we've noticed this bias in how people want to fight fraud and we want them to make informed decisions. So let's build a product that makes them really aware of exactly what's happening when they sort of write these rules or, or take these actions. I think this is a case of what we're hoping here is that radar will, you know, in some ways it's not meant to be a fraud stopping product. It's meant to be a revenue maximizing product which is sort of acts by helping to stop fraud at the appropriate rate. And that's not an angle that we would have taken if we had just collated a list of every single request and ranked them by count and done exactly what people are asking for. Fascinating. Michael, I want to thank you for coming on Software Engineering Daily. It's been a great conversation. It's great to have you being here. Thank you. A few quick announcements before we go. Software Engineering Daily is conducting our annual listener survey which is available on softwareengineeringdaily.com. You can click on the survey link. The survey really helps us understand our listeners and gives us data that we can show to advertisers that help get us better sponsorship deals. Also, the Software Engineering Daily community has started working on Minor Ranker. This is an open source news feed platform. We are trying to democratize the idea of a news feed so that the only news feeds in town are not necessarily Twitter or Facebook or any other centralized news feed. We'd like to make it possible for anybody to make a news feed. So you can check out the Minor Ranker project at MinorRanker.com. You can check out an implementation of Minor Ranker at SoftwareDaily.com. You can find links to all of this stuff at SoftwareEngineeringDaily.com. There you can also find a link to join our Slack group to follow us on Meetup for future meetups and other information. So thanks again for listening.